Hello everyone, my name is Gil Cohen, and uh, me and Omri will be your hosts in, in the next talk, Down the Rabbit Hole, a journey towards a weakness in Chrome and a new hacking technique. My name is Gil, let me introduce myself. So I'm the head of application security, as you just mentioned, and secure SDLC. I've been practicing cybersecurity for the last 18 years or so, and I've been lecturing in uh, international conferences as well. I'm experiencing penetration tests of all kinds. I hacked, hacked into pretty much everything that you can think of, uh, including networks and boxes, but my passion is application security, and this is what, why I'm putting my, the focus, focus on this uh, uh, today as well. Uh, I'm part of the services department at SAI, uh, that performs PT, Red Team in forensics, security architecture, etc. I'll talk just a few words at the end of the presentation about the company that we work for uh, that also develops a product called Hiver, which is automation and insights product. Omri. Thank you very much, Gil. My name is Omri Inbar. I'm a senior cybersecurity specialist at, at Psysys. I'm a penetration tester, a bug hunter, a CV searcher, and all-around hacking enthusiast. I've been in the security game for about eight years and a couple of years more uh, Developing, first time at a conference, definitely first time lecturing, and feeling very excited and happy to be here. Okay, so let's start. Uh, let's start with a basic introduction of what was the trigger for the entire research. Serial F injection. Serial F injection, if you don't know, this is a simple attack, which is a reflected attack, like cross-site scripting. Take a look in here. When you write ABCD as part of the get URL, in this specific example, you get the same value in here. So uh, the first condition is that the value needs to be reflected. And what happens in CRLF injection? CRLF actually stands for carriage return and line feed, which is actually new line characters. Uh, a new line is not a single character. It's actually two characters. And uh, this is their representation, uh, percentage 0D, percentage 0A is in URL encoding. And take a look at what's happening uh, when you have this reflected value, which is also vulnerable to CRLF injection. Uh, when you write ABCD, percentage zero D, percentage zero A, ABCD, in the response, instead of getting the actual value, you get a new line. And this enables you to inject your own response headers. And this was the initial uh, vulnerability that initiated the entire research. So what can you do with it? Uh, in some cases, when you have 200 OK or 404 or any 200 and 400 response, you can inject your own body. You can just put two, a combination of two CRLF uh, at the beginning, uh, marking the section as the new body of the, of the response, and add your new response body. Uh, in this case, just a plain script with an alert, and uh, when you, uh, this is the response, it would be executed by the browser. And this is not a new attack. Uh, it's, uh, obviously, it's cross-site scripting via CRLF injection. And there are multiple uh, examples uh, similar to that. For example, uh, PayPal, nine years ago, had a, a, a vulnerability with CRLF injection that enabled the attacker to inject his own cookie and then uh, get exploited with cross-site scripting. Let's see a, a short example of that. So say hello to PayPal from the past. I don't know if you remember, this is how it looked like. And you can see here, someone found, you don't need the percentage zero D, percentage zero A all the time. You can settle with one of them in some cases. Someone found CRLF injection in PayPal and then set cookie of the value 1122. And indeed, when you do this and you take a look at the cookies, the value is being set. Another thing that he found, that there is a page called cookie.jsp. And this cookie actually displays, uh, this page actually displays the cookie values, and it is vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So if you embed your own script as part of the cookie value, it would be vulnerable, and it would execute. And all what's left for him to do is to combine the two parts. So here is another example. Instead of uh, injecting his own script, he injected an iframe with a phishing website, and you can see in here, this is how the phishing website looks like. So the first request sets the cookie with the iframe value. And the second request, cookie.jsp, displays it as part of the PayPal domain. 
and this uh, it, it can create a very uh, good looking phishing attack that would lure a lot of users to enter their credentials and uh, by the way he probably could have just created his own new body instead of doing the set cookie thing uh, but this is just to show you that it's not in, it's nothing new but there is a problem more than 90% of all CRLF injections are in uh, uh, redirection requests. 301, 302, 307, move temporarily, uh, move permanently, etc. And in these requests, uh, the response is not parsed, the response body. Although you do have HTML in here, uh, uh, modern browsers totally ignore it. And then we, saw, we thought, okay, how can we ex ex still make it exploitable? How can we do something with injecting our own header. And we came up with this, injecting another location header. Whenever you have a redirection request, you have the location where the browser needs to follow. And what if we, op we add our own malicious URL? So this is actually an open redirect vulnerability, which is quite common, but uh, we tried to exploit it. And then we saw this error error respond header multiple locations and we thought okay it's not acceptable thank you very much i hope you enjoyed the talk no, just kidding it was just the beginning of the journey uh, because then uh, we, st we initiated an awesome research process and omri is crazy or very professional uh, human being thank you very much gil so this is where we started to, to delve into the situation and we started to think, okay, uh, we know the standard case, but maybe there are edge cases. Maybe the, not in all uh, situations do we get that response. Not in all browsers, not in all sites. So the way to, to research this was to find a mass of sites and to start just scanning and see if we have any other cases. So first of all, we, the first step was to find, uh, to take many, many websites and to find uh, and to filter the ones that are actually susceptible to CRLF injection. So for this, we used uh, the tool, open source tool called Nuclei by Project Discovery. You might have heard about it a lot in this uh, conference. And it's a wonderful tool uh, for scanning vulnerabilities, whether it's static or whether it's uh, web-based, that uh, uh, you make HTTP, HTTP requests. And the wonderful thing about Nuclei is that it's customizable, right? So uh, whenever you want to uh, write a new scanner for a vulnerability that you discovered, or that you, you're trying to search for, you don't have to write a whole script or a whole uh, tool by yourself. You can just use Nuclei. It, uh, it, it takes in YAML templates uh, like so, uh, which are fairly simple. This is an example of a, uh, an open source YAML template uh, of Nuclei. You see, you just say what kind of request it is, in, in this case, get. Uh, what's the path? This, in this case, the base URL. You can also add a path, para parameters, whatever you want. And what are the conditions of a success? In this example, this is a template that searches for um, Amazon secrets. So if the body contains the regular expression below, then it's a hit, right? You can then give it a list of URLs, not just one URL scan them, and you can see below on the log uh, that uh, some, uh, some results were found. So this is exactly what we did. So the first step was to find sites that are vulnerable to CRLF injection. Th this is the template that we use. This is not ours. This is an open source template that you can find on the Nuclei Templates uh, repository on GitHub. There are all sorts of different uh, uh, subcases here. Uh, the main uh, thing to search for here is that the template uh, tries to inject the set cookie, CRLF injection, CRLF injection uh, cookie. Uh, there's a standard percentage uh, 0D, percentage 0A, and all sorts of other uh, Unicode encoding and all, or so, all sorts of subcases. And if we, the regular expression below, which is we have the set cookie value inside the header, and uh, then it's a hit. So that's the template that we use. The next thing, after we have uh, a mass of sites that are vulnerable to CRLF injection, was to try on all of them two locations and to see if some of them don't get the error but actually do get a redirect. And for this, we use a, a library called Playwright, uh, which is wonderful for automation, mostly used for QA. And um, the wonderful thing about Playwright, uh, 
in contrast to Selenium and other libraries which are also great, is that uh, out of the box, Playwright supports many different browsers, including Chromium-based uh, Chromium like Chrome, Edge, uh, Opera, uh, Firefox, and also WebKit, which is uh, more, most common on iOS. Uh, so the next thing was to try on all the CRLF injection uh, susceptible sites to inject two locations with all kinds of browsers and to see the behavior. And of course, profit. So the first, uh, the first case that we found that uh, really boggled us was uh, as so. We found two sites of the same company uh, that were susceptible to CRLF injection. What, one of them was the site .asia and one of them was .com. And in one of them, the .asia one, when, when we injected uh, a new location, we actually did get a redirect. Uh, and on the other one, we got the uh, response header multiple location error. Okay, so of course, what we did was let's see the let's see the HTTP response. Let's see what's the difference between them. So we put them side by side, and for the life of us, we couldn't find anything different except for the one was dot Asia and what, one was dot com. There was no other dissimilarity. So we. So this was us, exactly like this handsome fellow right over here. Uh, this was us uh, for a couple of days. We tried to delve in and to see what was different between the two sites. We were figured maybe it's an extension on one of the browsers. Maybe it's, it has to do something with certificate, the SSL versions, the HSTS preload, all of that. And uh, none of them uh, uh, panned out. When we finally find out the answer. So after opening the sites in the, in the browser, in the Chromium-based browser, uh, we actually found that the site that didn't work only spoke in the protocol HTTP 1.1, and the site that did redirect was speaking in the HTTP 2 protocol. HTTP 2 protocol, for those of you who don't know, is an uh, optimization of the HTTP protocol, and the main difference is that it uh, supports compression of the headers uh, for faster transport. Okay, so... Uh, by, and by the way, the, the reason that we didn't see it in, uh, in curl, in CURL, the, the tool that we used to look at the responses, was the fact that curl, uh, by default, uh, tries to speak in HTTP 1.1, while the browser tries to speak in HTTP 2. If the site supports that, wonderful. And if not, it, uh, it goes to HTTP 1.1. But if you specifically, uh, what we did here in the example, if you specifically ask for HTTP 2, it does try that. So let's see the example here. All right, so the first example here we're going to see is using the uh, curl tool. Uh, we're going to try to go to a site and inject a location header, but the site will only speak in HTTP 1.1. And we see the two location headers, and if we try to put it in the browser, then we get the obvious uh, error for the handling of multiple locations. Cool. And now the second site we're going to put is will uh, will support HTTP2 as we can see here, wonderful HTTP2 multiple location headers, and if we put it in the browsers in the browser, we will see that we will get a redirect. Where where we will redirect, we will speak about uh, soon. But we did not get the uh, uh, did not get the error, and we did get the redirect. Wonderful. All right, so. Basically, we found it in Chrome. The next step was to try it on all browsers to figure out exactly what, uh, who, who's to blame or uh, what browsers are susceptible. And we found that it was not only Chrome, but it was Edge, Opera, the Samsung native browser, Brave, and more. And the common denominator between all of them was that they're all based on Chromium. And Chromium is open source, so, sourced, which is uh, wonderful. So we also downloaded Chromium and tried to debug it and to find the exact point of failure. And this is just a, a wonderful uh, screenshot of uh, uh, many debugging prints. Uh, Chromium is very hard to debug because it's uh, asynchronous, uh, and it's also we thought it's uh, quick and dirty is the, the, the way to go. So we wanted to include it. And also, I love seeing my name uh, multiple times. And we actually, yeah, and we actually uh, did find that there uh, the the place of handling that there is uh, plain as uh, uh, as day. You can see that if the headers contain multiple co uh, copies of the field location, then you return the error. So the quest question remained. Why, it is, why is it vulnerable? But why? 
So we further investigated it, and we came up with this specific configuration. Obviously, this is a bug in Chromium, so you need the, the user to use a Chromium-based browser. You need this website to, be, uh, to use HTTP2 and to be vulnerable to CRLF injection. And you need to control the first location header. So we figured out HTTP2, we figured out CRLF injection, everything was perfectly clear, but we didn't know what were the cases where you control the first location header because we saw some other cases where this was not the case. So this is a website that was vulnerable. You can see that we inject, uh, we uh, actually can inject our own uh, location header, uh, which is the first one. And this is another website which is not vulnerable. For some reason, you can see that the location header is all messed up and we couldn't figure out what was the vulnerable configuration and we started to further digging in until we found it. So the vulnerable configuration is, again, HTTP2 enabled website, CRLF injection, Chromium based website, and the header's order is swapped by a reverse proxy. Uh, so the injected value goes into the first location header instead of the original second location header. And uh, this is how it looks like from a high level perspective. You can see uh, you have the browser that speaks with the reverse proxy in HTTP2. The reverse proxy speaks with the backend server in HTTP 1.1. And when the response uh, is received, it, the order of the headers is being swapped by the reverse proxy. And again, we, uh, we uh, research what is the common denominator of uh, this specific configuration, and we found Cloudflare. Cloudflare is very common for, HT for caching and reverse proxy. And they specifically say, while HTTP2 is not supported between the Cloudflare network and the customer origin, which is the backend server, Cloudflare Railgun provides similar benefits for connection multiplexing and HTTP header compression. So they basically uh, implemented their own implementation of HTTP-like uh, configuration. So any website that is protected by Cloudflare was actually vulnerable. So we created our own website, uh, GLC Test. I like my name also. And uh, we, we, uh, we made it deliberately vulnerable to CRLF injection, and you see that it was actually uh, open redirect, uh, vulnerable to open redirect, and we could um, redirect to example.com, which was very nice. Uh, we found another, uh, so here is a real life website that was also vulnerable. And we found another common technology, which is Nginx. And this is where things started to, be, to become even more interesting. So uh, we digged it uh, further in, and we saw that uh, a specific configuration of Nginx is vulnerable, is actually making the response headers order to swap. And this is the configuration. Don't worry if you don't know Nginx configuration. It's not that uh, complicated. Uh, you have the server name. You have uh, it listens on port number 443, HTTPS, obviously. And it supports HTTP2. And here in the last line, you can see proxy pass. This is the redirection to the backend server. And this is the IP address of the backend server. But this directive, request URI, actually tells the Nginx to take the query string and put it in here. But here's a spoiler for you. You don't really need it. If you do not put the same directive, it acts exactly the same. But for some reason, if you do put it, the response headers are, uh, order is swapped. And we found some other uh, examples of Nginx that were not vulnerable. And we got HTTP2 protocol error. And this is where uh, you, this directive is not used. And we found multiple notable examples in the wild. Uh, obviously, we cannot disclose it, but uh, the same company that Omri just showed you of the .com and .asia, they have some other websites that were vulnerable, uh, and some other even more famous websites. Uh, a search engine was vulnerable in the same uh, um, exact same technique, and uh, by the way, it, it didn't allow us to redirect uh, to any address that contained dots. So this is a cool obfuscation technique, uh, of obfuscating an IP address using octet encoding. This is actually a valid IP address, so you can put it in here uh, and it would re redirect as well. 
And PayPal, I already showed you PayPal nine years ago, so they keep their tradition, apparently, and they, still, uh, they were still vulnerable to CRLF injection, but they only use HTTP 1.1, and uh, by the time we finished the research, they already fixed it. They probably monitored the logs. They saw that we are injecting CRLF injection in their main website, www.paypal.com, uh, and they fixed it during the research. Uh, so the aftermath, uh, we responsibly disclosed it to Cloudflare, saying your railgun uh, um, behavior swaps the response headers um, order, and they said, yeah, it's not the root cause, so it's not a, pro a real problem, and okay. Nginx uh, got us the same response, and Google, uh, they fixed it. They fixed the Chromium browser, uh, and as a result, all the other browsers that use Chromium as their base were fixed, and we received a small bounty, but don't tell everyone, Google is pretty cheap. Uh, but they only financed, uh, they financed the beers that we drink here in Ireland, but uh, nothing more. And then it became even more interesting. So if things weren't interesting, weren't interesting enough before, this is where it started to get real juicy. So while we were uh, on this uh, amazing journey and we were debugging browsers, setting up reverse proxies and whatnot, uh, Gil actually noticed that uh, there, there are more uh, variables in the Nginx proxy that you can use that have a different behavior. And he found two of them called uh, URI and document URI. And these specific ones had the different behavior of making uh, the request susceptible to CRLF, but the request, not the response, the request from the reverse proxy to the server, to the backend server. So once we set up this configuration in our lab, uh, we tried to inject our, lo our, uh, our location header, and lo and behold, we found that in the GET request itself from the reverse proxy backwards, uh, we had a new line and the location header was there. Okay. So this is an example of, the, of two uh, vulnerable configurations, uh, as we said, exactly like before, but with the $URI and $document URI. And so we figured, okay, what's the best uh, thing that uh, an attacker... Can, uh, can inject in a, in a request header, and that was the host header. The host header itself, uh, which uh, differentiates the, uh, this, the request itself, goes to a, a specific IP, but the host header tells it what uh, site it wants on that IP, which is usually the same, but not always, as we will see below. So what is it good for? What can we do with the, with the host header injection in the request? So we did find all sorts of stuff, uh, open redirects, which we'll see soon, request smuggling, and what about the case of shared hosting? What if the, the request goes to uh, shared hosting like Google Cloud, AWS S3, GitHub Pages, Azure, and more? Um, basically, the, the shared hosting sites uh, have many requests going to the same IP or the same several IPs. And the only differentiation between which site you're going to get is determined by the host header. So first of all, we, uh, we found multiple sites that when we injected the host header, here you can see uh, we added also, of course, uh, uh, a space, HTTP 1.1, because we didn't want to break the request, because if we uh, uh, straight up inject the CRLF, then there's not going to be an, uh, the start of the request, the HTTP 1.1, which is all, always in the request, a space, then a CRLF, the host header that we try to inject, and two CRLFs to, uh, to, determine, to in, invalidate the rest of the request and make it the headers inside the part of the body and not part of the, of the headers. And we saw, for example, that many sites that we injected a new host header, like example.com, we got a redirect to example.com. And then we saw that those same sites, if we manually, using burp proxy, didn't inject the, our payload, but we manually edited the host header, we also got the same redirection, which indicates that somewhere along the path, specifically probably on the, on the reverse proxy itself, the entire request is looked at, and if the host header is different, then it redirects to it. And when we injected a new host header, it got mangled, and it rec recognized our injected host header as the host header. Another interesting case that we found is request smuggling. Request smuggling is an attack that uh, you send one request to the reverse proxy, and the reverse proxy actually sends two requests to the backend server. So here you can see an example. Uh, we injected uh, this uh, payload of a host, uh, host localhost and new uh, CRLFs and two uh, CRLFs uh, combination to end the request and then we got this uh, except for the uh, the actual response we got this error message saying uh, 400 bad requests 
And this is because the uh, original body of the request that is sent to the backend server is now invalid. It, is, it was considered as a separate request and it is an invalid request. So we got this error. And if I inject only one CRLF injection, meaning I do not mess up with the original body of the request, everything is fine, I do not get any error. Uh, and I can even start my own new request, entirely new request, a GET request, and if I make this a valid one, including the host header and HTTP one, uh, I get 200 OK, which actually proves that this is an, uh, a live request smuggling. Uh, but it, was, it wasn't a consistent uh, case. In some cases, we got this error. In some uh, this response, in other cases, we didn't. Uh, and we didn't, couldn't find an actual working payload. Uh, because uh, it, you can see here, this is a, the default Nginx page. So it's not a real website that we can uh, maybe send two requests to the backend server and uh, make uh, any attack uh, with our injected value. But it was cool nonetheless. And then we focused on shared hosting. And uh, we created our own lab uh, with a shared uh, uh, with a, a reverse proxy uh, and uh, uh, that redirect to GitHub pages. A proof of concept, we created this green looking website. This was uh, vulnerable to CRLF injection. And another website, uh, you can see here, github.io. And then we exploited the green looking website with CRLF injection and added our own, our own host header. And uh, this is the decoded value. You can see that the uh, URL in the, the domain in the URL and the domain in the host are different but it doesn't really matter because the only thing that he looks at is the host error. And we actually got the content of the second uh, website with the first website's address, which is very interesting. So what just happened here? We created our own Nginx, uh, which is deliberately misconfigured uh, and a shared, reverse, uh, a shared hosting environment. And instead of uh, uh, of the regular flow of the Nginx directing to the real backend server, we caused the Nginx to uh, redirect to our server instead. Uh, and let's see a quick demo of that. Okay, so here we have a website called, oh, what happened? Okay, so here we have a website called OWASP, o.wasp.com. This is a WASP website, which is a very uh, useful website. You can save the address. Well, actually, no, it's in my local computer. Uh, and we have another website, which is called BWASP. And here I can inject um, any special character, in fact, such as percentage zero one, and I get uh, uh, this, uh, oh, sorry. HTTP, not HTTPS. I don't believe in security. No, just kidding. You get a bad request. And this is a telltale sign uh, for a possible CRLF injection. And now I can just complete the request with a valid value, HTTP 1.1, and add my own host header and redirect to the bwasp.com and end the request. Oh, again, HTTP instead of HTTPS. And now you can see that the content of the website is the bees website. But the domain is that of OWASP. So what just happened here? The malicious server doesn't need to, to use the same reverse proxy, but it only needs to use the share, same shared hosting. Uh, so um, you can see here that uh, BWASP was directly accessible from the internet, 
uh, and we, the reverse proxy has its own legitimate websites of WASP and Hornets, uh, and I can, by injecting my own host header, I can redirect to any website that sits in the same shared hosting, which is really nice. And then we had this interesting debate. Omri told me, yeah, yes, this is a new cross-site scripting. This is a new form of cross-site scripting. And I said, no, it's not. Yeah, but you can execute script on uh, other websites. And I said, yes, but you bypass all defenses, tamper the execution flow, and replace the access server. And you can do a lot more than cross-site scripting. Introducing front jacking, a new technique, front-end server hijacking. Front, uh, front end server hijacking is a hacking technique that combines CLF injection, HTTP request server injection, and cross site scripting, exploiting a poorly configured Revex proxy deployed with a shared hosting environment, allowing attackers to inject a new host header, hijack the front end server, and replace the access server with an attacker controlled server. This enables an attacker to execute any reflected XSS and phishing related payloads while bypassing any defensive mechanisms, including content security policy, HTTP only cookie attributes, web application firewalls, course, and HTTPS certificate. So let's have a deeper look at that and compare cross site scripting with front jacking. So if you have content security policy, content security policy, if you don't know, this is a response header that limits the loaded scripts and resources. You can, you can then uh, just make your website disable loading of ex external scripts. But in front jacking, we are the server. We don't need content security policy. We can just uh, handle, we can just uh, um, 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 send the user any script that we want because we are the front end server. HTTP only uh, disables uh, accessing uh, session cookies uh, from, uh, with JavaScript. But we are the server. We just receive it from the client. We don't need HTTP only. We don't need JavaScript to read it for us. Uh, Cross-origin resource sharing uh, disables a website to access APIs of another website. Uh, but again, we are the, in the same domain as the original website. So we can just access the API of the original website. HTTPS certificate validation won't help in both cases because the content uh, would be malicious, although the domain is valid. And the only thing that would partially mitigate front jacking is web application firewalls, some of them. Uh, identify CRLF injection as an attack and would block uh, front jacking in some cases. The related uh, CWEs is uh, user uh, interface misinterpretation uh, of critical information and uh, cross-site scripting. These are the closest and I, we hope that after this uh, uh, presentation we would submit this as a new CWE because the root cause is completely different and the defenses would not help. Uh, and then we uh, started to, uh, to find some more examples in the wild. Wonderful. So up until now, everything was in a lab environment. We thought of a new uh, attack. We made a lab for it, proved that it is theoretically possible, which is nice. But again, it's not real unless you find it in the wild. So the next thing we did is what we made nuclei templates like we saw before, but to specifically search for cases of front uh, end hijacking. So what we did, this is an example of a template that we built uh, for Google Cloud. So basically what we did was, first of all, we went to Google Cloud, made our own bucket there, a malicious one, named Front Jack Testing. And this is the content that, that was in our site, uh, HTML script, alert document domain script, HTML. And here we can see that uh, we sent uh, requests with our complete payload uh, directing to our bucket. And then we uh, checked it on many, many websites. And if the response had our content, then we know that we got that we front jacked. And this is another example of a template that we made, but this one was for S3 Cloud. It's uh, basically the same. We made a, a front jack testing uh, bucket there as well with the same content. Uh, however, S3 has many regions, regions for different countries uh, around the world. So sometimes you go to an endpoint and you ask for a specific bucket there, uh, but they're nice enough to tell you, listen, this bucket exists. But it's not in this region. But that works for us as well. Because if we see this uh, uh, message as well, the specified bucket exists in another region, please direct requests. Then we also know that we hit it. We just need to uh, make buckets in a different location. And of course, that's what we did. After, if we saw that, we had later on, we had uh, buckets in every region. And if we had that uh, response, we just uh, injected all of our different buckets until we uh, hit the one that was in the same region. And then we, we can see an example here. We started to find uh, examples out in the wild. Uh, th these are two examples, uh, live ones in S3. We see a website that's not ours, but we have our own content there. 
And this is another one with the Google Cloud exploitation. Basically, looks the same, but uh, it redirects uh, the the shared hosting behind it is uh, is different. And then we 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 hit a couple, and then we we had our big uh, our big break. One of the S3 sites that we found that is vulnerable, we checked its IP in a tool called Security Trails. Very nice uh, service. I don't have any stocks there, but uh, I recommend it uh, uh, a lot. And the the service basically lets you uh, insert a domain or IP. And you can see all of the other domains uh, specify that are associated with that IP. So basically, uh, we found many sites that were so that went to the same three IPs. And when we went to security trails, we saw that uh, there were over 10,000 different domains that are registered on those uh, three IPs. So we figured, okay, this is a shared hosting. Like they they have uh, this is this is something else. This is a uh, uh, reverse proxy that redirects specifically to them. And there, because that reverse proxy is uh, vulnerable. All of them are vulnerable, more than 10,000. So here we can see a very scientific graph of the number of front-end uh, hijacking that we found in the wild. It started with zero, then two, then more than 12,500. Very, very scientific. Uh, don't tell anyone. One year ago. And was it, oh, yeah. It was exactly one year ago, if you can uh, see. Imagine that. And so we started to, we wanted to find out, OK, uh, which, exa which uh, exact shared hosting uh, service is uh, vulnerable so we can disclose it to them. So we went to one, to one of the sites, and using Wappalizer, we found the specific um, the specific, specific product that they all use, the common denominator between them. And we went to the site, and and we actually did see that they're publishing their their message is gather subscribers with a hosted landing page or a forum embedded on your website. And upon a further inspection in the site, we actually did see that they they say that these are the three IPs. That, the, that their hosting service provides, and those were the exact uh, three IPs that we found from outside, which confirmed that, uh, that this is the one. And so just to, to make sure, we registered uh, to the site. We, um, we created our own page out of the box, omritest.tk, nice name, and, uh, and, the, and, uh, and another one that is uh, vulnerable, and another one with our malicious content, and right out of the box, no other configurations, set up the website, give it our, our beautiful payload right here, and we got a success. So, of course, we want to disclose it to them. Try to uh, contact them and uh, see if they have a bug bounty program. And we got the, this response. Hiya, I never heard about the bug bounty program, to be honest. Is that some sort of security? Would you mind telling me more about it? And eventually, we did find that the, in some uh, godforsaken place in, the, in their website, they did uh, have a section, Report of Vulnerability. If you believe you have security vulnerability, uh, please let us know and disclose it. We'll investigate it and fix it. And uh, right hot off the, uh, off the oven, at the oven, this Saturday, this last Saturday, just for the fun of it, I ran another scan, and we found another hosting service unrelated to that, a lot smaller. You can see here they had only 276 uh, registered domains. Um, but we're right now in the middle of disclosing it to them, but that was fun just uh, before the convention to find another one. So, aftermath number two. Uh, again, we responsibly disclosed to Nginx, again, the different configuration, and again, they said the same thing. It's not our problem. Uh, the user should configure their uh, Nginx as well, even though there's no added value to using that uh, variable there, the URI or document URI. Uh, we disclosed this to many vulnerable websites. Some of them ignored them and are still vulnerable to this very day. And the shared landing page uh, provider, first they didn't know what a bug bounty is. Eventually they fixed it, but they gave us no credit, no bounty. Not nice. So we had an amazing journey. So let's, take, let's do a quick recap. So we started with a simple CRLF injection that is uh, often overlooked. It doesn't consider as anything really special. Uh, but we found some exploitation uh, of it as open redirects. Uh, we eventually found a bug in Chromium and awarded with a small reward from Google and another form of CRLF injection in Nginx uh, ending up in a new hacking technique we called front jacking that enables you to f uh, hijack the front end server. Uh, so uh, the lessons from this journey is always be curious. It started with just a small behavior that Omri sent me on, up, on WhatsApp saying, hey, Gil, take a look at this. We have this very uh, um, similar website that behaves differently on Chrome. And always work with uh, smart people. Thank you, Omri. Thank you, Gil. Uh, and uh, something practical, 
Check your Nginx proxy configuration. Don't use URI, request URI, or document URI, and specifically not URI and document URI, because uh, this is um, then vulnerable to front jacking. Uh, and uh, we contacted um, uh, Nginx, and, and they said that uh, they won't fix it. Uh, Google did fix it. But for some reason, Nginx said it's the user's problem. You need to configure it correctly. Again, it doesn't really add any functionality. There is absolutely no reason to, for you to use it in reverse proxy configuration. So, but still, they allow it for some reason. Uh, and people often ask us, uh, wait, how serious is front jacking? Is it a severe vulnerability? Is it more severe compared to cross-site scripting? And our answer, it really depends. Is cross-site scripting a severe de de vulnerability? It really depends of, on the system. Uh, cross-site scripting can be used for phishing, open redirect, and sensitive information disclosure, but it really depends on what, what the, uh, the vulnerable website is and who can access it. And I promised you just a few words about size. So it, obviously, cross-site scripting in public websites is more severe compared to an internal one. Uh, if you map the attacker's uh, attack graph and attack path, uh, this is, can be assessed scientifically, and this is what we do at SAI. We do some uh, um, services and red teaming and stuff, but we also have this product, awesome product called Hiver, uh, which actually um, uh, we build the attack graph, and we can scientifically measure uh, how severe is cross-site scripting, uh, one cross-site scripting com compared to the other, and also cost of reach, and we help CISOs make better informed decisions based on quantifying uh, the risk by collecting uh, real data from attacking campaigns. Uh, so we want to thank, uh, uh, I want to thank Omri and thank our families for uh, being, uh, being there for us uh, while we worked off hours after a full day of work and investigating this. Uh, any questions? Yes. Oh, a microphone maybe? Hello, hello. Um, yeah, really interesting presentation. Um, so I think there are examples there where the reverse proxy was the one that was ending up causing the redirect to a different site. Like sometimes it was going through the reverse proxy, sometimes it wasn't going through the reverse proxy. If the reverse proxy was the one that was adding in content security policy, would that help mitigate in that case? Because in that case, even if you're pulling the page from a different backend, by a different server, the content security policy would still get added, added by the reverse proxy and that could potentially mitigate cross-site scripting on the page that loads. Yes, uh, well, content security policy usually uh, limits the domain that you can uh, load uh, external scripts from, but we are the server, so content security policy won't bother us because we can then serve whatever content that we like, including any JavaScript. Uh, so it won't really help against uh, this uh, specific scenario. Any more questions? Hi. Uh, did you try maybe directing to internal websites that are not exposed to the internet to use it like as a SSRF routing thingy? Uh, yes, of course, we, we did try that. Uh, the, the problem was that uh, even though we can inject a different host header and try to get uh, different content, the request itself still goes to the same place. Uh, we did try to see if maybe behind the scenes the reverse proxy takes the host header and then tries another different request using Burp Collaborator. We tried, we tried uh, internal IPs and stuff like that, uh, but even different ports on the same host. But it did not work because eventually uh, the problem was in the request that was sent to the specific place. At the, so it didn't send it uh, a different, uh, to a different place, even though we tried to. Um, great talk. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit more again about the um, the part that Chromium had to fix? So Chromium basically had a, an inspection whether the response contained two location headers, but only for the HTTP2 part. Uh, I forgot to mention it, by the way, so thank you for the question. Uh, they actually first redirected and only then checked if there are two location headers, only in HTTP2 implementation. Uh, so the fix was pretty simple. They needed to do the, the same behavior as HTTP 1.1 and make sure that they, check, they do this test before redirection and not after. So this, this is what they fixed. Thanks. Uh, 
Any more questions? Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering if we could have, if we uh, implemented some kind of white listing uh, on the reverse proxy uh, regarding what IP addresses it might send HTTP requests to, would that mitigate this issue? Um, the whitelist on the on the IP itself of the sender, um, I don't think so. But whitelisting the host header itself that uh, is requested in the request itself, definitely. It it should never be different than the one that you're trying to access. So even uh, even if you do consider, okay, the CRLF is a different thing, and you know many sites can be uh, susceptible in a different way. The request can be mangled. I think whitelisting the the actual uh, site that you're trying to to go to access to, or the several sites that uh, that the reverse proxy reverses to, uh, should work. Yeah. Well, thank you. you. You always access the same IP address. The IP address never changes. Only the host header is changing, and then the shared hosting knows which site to to give you back. So if you whitelist it, uh, then this won't won't be possible. So the fix in Chrome, uh, it's only kind of mitigation because it uh, prevents redirects, but you can still inject uh, any XSS, right? Uh, yes, yes exactly. In 200 OK, in 404, in any 200 or 400 response, you can still do uh, to inject your own new body and it would perfectly work with uh, cross-site scripting. Exactly. Any more questions? Thanks for the talk. And, uh, really interesting. Closer. Okay. Thanks. Um, just wanted to ask um, uh, Chromium, uh, did they record it as a CVSS, uh, as a CVE? And if so, with what uh, severity? So, unfortunately, no. We actually, uh, when it's such a big product such as Chromium, we would have preferred to have a CVE there uh, instead of a, a bounty. Uh, unfortunately, they, they, uh, they closed it. They said, like everyone else, they everyone everyone on the attack chain blamed the other guys. So they said, everyone said, no, it's not my problem. It's uh, if they fix it, then uh, then it's all fixed. Uh, but they were the, actually the only one that actually did a fix, and they did give us a couple of dollars. So uh, so no CVE there yet, but uh, but they gave gave a small bounty and fixed it. Great. And one one more quick, quick one. Um, if you need to wrap it up, uh, the entire research project that you had here. How much effort did you invest in it? Um, I would say uh, uh, roughly two months at night times. Um, every, almost every day. Thank Thanks you. for our family. We, we wanted to tattoo the TV number, but unfortunately they... Next TV. Yeah, next, next one. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, thank you very much.